Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. Well, I have got some exciting news. From now on, the name of this podcast will be the Truth Changes Everything podcast with Dr. Jeff Myers. Truth changes everything. In this show, I'm going to continue to be your host and hopefully model how to engage in thoughtful worldview conversations Because those reveal how we can join in Jesus's redemptive work in the world. And I'm going to continue talking with thoughtful guests about important topics, uh, maybe even on topics where we have disagreements, all to help you better embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. It's a journey. And on the journey, I hope that we're going to see how Jesus, the embodiment of the truth, does in fact change everything. I want to demonstrate how to have thoughtful worldview conversations, conversations that reveal how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. So the podcast is going to be released on the same feed. You don't have to subscribe anywhere else. It's just this new name, I believe, is going to help make the show easier for new listeners to find and to really help share the heart of what the show is all about. So Please, I ask you this every week, please be sure to tell your friends and family about this show and about this update. I can't wait to share the important conversations with you and show how Jesus, the truth, changes everything. One of the most important common objections to Christianity is the claim that a good God would not allow evil. Maybe you felt that. For most of us, This isn't just a question that we opine about. It's one that we feel deep in our hearts. It's in our bones. We have the pain of difficult life experiences. Welcome to the Truth Changes Everything podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Myers. On this show, we explore where God is at work, changing everything through Jesus, the truth incarnate. Today, we're gonna be talking about how truth changes everything and especially the way we think about and experience suffering. And my guest is Dr. Douglas Groteis. Dr. Groteis has a fire in his bones for the biblical message of truth. He has been explaining to the world and to the church for nearly, I don't know, 50 years through his teachings, preaching, writing, mentoring, and general witness. He has a passion to take to the streets, the truth and significance of a biblical Christian worldview for all of life. So to this end, he publishes academic works, popular works, he preaches in churches, gives public lectures, engages in debates. He's appeared on hundreds of programs and podcasts. He's knowledgeable, he's sharp, but he's a gentle communicator of a biblical Christian message. And this show is a turning of a corner in a way because he's not just talking about philosophical aspects of a biblical worldview and a big apologetics books. He's talking about personal pain and suffering that he has experienced and how understanding a biblical worldview helped him through a very difficult period of time. It's, it's going to be very powerful. Dr. Doug Groteis, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Really appreciate your ministry. Now, you just moved from a longtime position at Denver Seminary to being at Cornerstone University in Michigan. You're just saying that you're trying to get your library settled and everything. So I know you're in a temporary location, not in your regular podcast position there, but thank you for taking time to be on the program today. Well, you're welcome. I really appreciate the work that you do. And I've spoken at Summit a few times over the years and uh, it's so meaningful and so significant. So, uh, May God keep blessing your work, Jeff. Well, uh, Doug, thank you, and and yours as well. The, uh, the reason I wanted to talk today uh, with you is because a few years ago, you, you you wrote a book on lament and suffering that I thought was profoundly beautiful. It was very raw, and and it and it felt to me like. There was, I, we needed to hear what was going on in your life at that time. And then to really dig into this idea of, of lament and suffering, because over the years, I know you've spoken at Summit, I don't know, going back, what, 30 years? The one question students have always asked all the way through, their questions change culturally. What about transgender now? Nobody asked that in the 1980s. But the one question they've always asked is, how can there be a good God in the middle of the evil and suffering that we see taking place. So tell us a little bit about that, 
that what led to that book? Yes, well, it was certainly a book I never wanted to write because I never wanted to live through what God had ordained for me and my wife, uh, Rebecca. But uh, Rebecca was a very brilliant woman. She wrote two books, co-edited an academic volume, was a masterful editor, poet, singer, and so on. And eventually we f realized something was wrong with her mind. We didn't know what was going on. And in 2014, she was diagnosed with a very rare form of dementia called primary progressive aphasia. And we were told that was terminal. We didn't know how long she had to live. So I had done some work on the philosophical problem of evil. Certainly in my book, Christian Apologetics, I have a big chapter on it called God and the Problem of Evil. But I'd also done some work on lament in the Bible, particularly in the Psalms and how the wisdom literature of the Bible relates to pain, suffering, frustration, things like that. So uh, I was uh, on the Denver Seminary campus where I worked for 31 years, and the editor at the time of Christianity Today, Mark Galley, was on campus. He said, I've heard about your sad situation with your wife. Do you think you'd like to write a reflection piece about that for us? And I said, I really appreciate you asking. Uh, I don't know, probably not. And then I went back to my office and I wrote the article very quickly and I revised it a little bit later. And it was published in 2015. And that article generated more responses from readers than anything I had gotten published in literally 40 years. Hmm. And after that article came out, three publishers contacted me about writing a book about it. And I really didn't want to, but I thought the book needed to be written. It was almost like the book was asking me to write it. It was a very odd sort of feeling. I'm not saying it's divinely inspired, okay, don't worry. But I really had this sense that it was something I needed to do to help people who are going through some very profound suffering. So it's unlike my other books, it's a memoir. And as you said, it is very visceral. And I'm not proud of everything I record in the book. And moreover, uh, I'm like Viktor Frankl. I, I think we need to watch out for exhibitionism. We live in a very exhibitionistic culture where everybody wants to spew everything about their inner feeling all the time and have people salute it. So I was reluctant to write the book for that reason. But I thought if God was working through my life and my late wife, Becky's life, and if I had something to say about it uh, from scripture and philosophically, that it might be helpful to people. Now, the book has not sold all that well. Uh, philosophers can relate to this problem, mm -hmm. <laughs> philosophers and theologians, but I have been very heartened that a number of people have been particularly ministered to by the book. Mm -hmm. So it's been more uh, quality, in helping some people work through their, their suffering, their emotions, their theology, then uh, some kind of a bestseller. You know, I'll take a bestseller if God wants to give me one, but if I can write a book that will help a certain number of people, then I, I'm grateful to God for that. Certainly, if you have a book that's a bestseller, it, it feels good. You look at the rating on Amazon, and that's nice. Lots and lots of people are, are yeah. giving assent to this. But... There are those books where if just one or two of the right people read them, mm -hmm. that it's transformative. I don't know if I'm one of those one or two right people, but the book had a profound influence on me. And I'll tell you why. And I want to ask you this very same question. Mm -hmm. I had written about evil and suffering in my book, Understanding the Faith. I had a chapter on that because it's one of the major objections that students have to a biblical understanding of God. And so I had written about it. And it was fairly, I, I tried to be as sensitive as possible, but then I went through a time of major suffering and I went back to read my chapter to see if I still believed what I had written in that chapter. Mm. And I did, I did still believe it. I, I maybe right. was even more sensitive to how personal pain is for people, but I, st I still believed it. But I, I wondered about that for you because as an apologist, and I've read, you know, I've read your book on apologetics. It's this thick. It's, you know, it's, it's major. It's massive. Um, it's dedicated to the philosophical arguments. But all of a sudden, when you're facing really deep grief, 
How do you, as a philosopher, work through that? Because on the one hand, you, you've got this, you've got these ideas that you want to bring. On the other hand, you have the actual physical reality. And now mm-hmm. all of a sudden, it seems like those two things just don't match up. Right. Well, when when Becky began to be ill, we were both uh, in our late 50s and we had lived a full life and had disappointments and struggles. And we had been engaging the scriptures and apologetics and walking with the Lord for many years. So this didn't come out of nowhere. It was simply more intense and more challenging than any other kind of suffering that we had. So if people read the book, they'll probably see that I don't ever question the existence of God or the truth of the Bible. And I wasn't just putting on a pretty face for the book. I didn't really. What I what was difficult for me was, how do I live through this and continue to love God? Uh, sometimes I would even come to the point where I was angry with God, and I didn't even, in a way, like God very much. You know, I thought there were a number of other ways he could have run the universe without my utterly brilliant wife getting terminal dementia. And I, I told him so. But uh, at the end of the day, and sometimes it was literally at the end of the day, I, I would say, Lord, the words of Peter, to whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. So uh, Rebecca and I had worked hard on our Christian worldview for about, 40 years as a couple. Uh, She had edited all my work. She'd written her own work on worship and on uh, various issues, women in the church. And so uh, we were, as John Lennox put it, intellectually converted. It wasn't just that we had experiences and we kind of went along with the beliefs of other Christians. We were utterly convinced that Christianity was true and rational. That didn't make it easy or it didn't mean we were always happy or brimming full of faith. There was a lot of fear, confusion, anger. But Christianity is not only a true and rational set of beliefs, a worldview, it's a way of living. It's walking with the living God. And in the Holy Scriptures, we have texts that relate to every aspect of life, ethics, metaphysics, and psychology, suffering. So I think the two books of the Bible that were the most significant to me were uh, the book of Ecclesiastes and also many of the Psalms, particularly some of the Psalms of Lament, and there may be 60 Psalms of Lament out of 150 Psalms, um, if Glenn Pemberton is right right in his book, um, Hurting with God. So it was painful, could be ugly. I'm not proud of the way I responded sometimes. But uh, to whom else can we go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. So I was never tempted to become an atheist or an agnostic or a new ager. I mean, I wrote four books against the new age. I can't do that. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think the suffering ever challenged my essential beliefs or my commitment to Christ. It was more... How do we live through this? I remember my dean at the time, a wonderful godly man named Randy McFarlane, who's since retired, uh, at one point said, Doug, just do the next good thing. Do the next right thing. You can't see far, far into advance in the future. So live by the promises of God and continue to serve God. So through that time, I continued to teach, preach, write, mentor, do evangelism as best I could. Um, But there was frustration, fear, and sometimes anger. And I start the book out with um, uh, an account of when we had to take Becky into the the hospital and she was in a psychiatric ward for a time. And I didn't understand how psychiatric wards worked. And I was confused and angry and and really just flew into a rage and almost got, I got kicked out because I was so angry. Mm. I thought, this is no way for a guy who teaches ethics at a seminary to act. I mean, what is going on here? But uh, through it all, God forgives, God directs, and 
where else can we go? To whom else can we go? He has the words of eternal life. So I'm thoroughly convinced that the evidence is overwhelmingly on the side of Christian theism hmm. and that the objections to Christian theism, particularly the problem of evil, are significant and we need to take them seriously. But Christianity, especially through Jesus Christ, gives meaning through suffering and especially through his own suffering, his suffering and death on the cross. And at one point, one of the seven sayings of the cross, of course, is Psalm 22, where he's praying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if he could feel that depth of anguish and it be redemptive, he is atoning for the sins of the world. And we know that he would be resurrected and ascended and that he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession. He will come again. If that suffering does not render the universe meaningless and pointless, then nothing does. Mm. Yeah. So if the suffering of Christ is redemptive and I'm in Christ, then even though I don't understand why I'm suffering and it's anguishing, I can somehow get through it. I want you to talk a little bit more about that because I, I think there are a lot of different worldviews of suffering. Uh, clearly an Eastern worldview, you mentioned New Age. A, a new age person is going to view suffering probably in a, a Buddhist way. The suffering is an illusion. Suffering is the main thing we have to think about in the world, but it's an illusion. And that's the way to think about it. On the other hand, you have a materialist view. Well, suffering just happens, you know, blank happens and that's just the way it yeah, is. Right. Right. Uh, but then you also have people who uh, you mentioned earlier, j just how you, uh, how so many people have this exhibitionist view that we almost believe that because Jesus suffered, then the more I show that I am suffering, the more righteous I am. Mm -hmm. And I, I see this getting twisted a lot. You know, it, it, it definitely feeds into kind of this oppressor versus oppressed mindset that you see with the neo-Marxist worldview, sort of the Hegelian dialectic. You know, if I... I can I can prove to you that I am deeply oppressed and that I am I, I'm suffering in an exquisite fashion and therefore I am more right and the people who are against me are therefore more wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I you know it I hate to think of it taking on a political dimension, but but it does in a way. So I I, we, I think we really need to dig in and understand the difference between a thoroughly biblical understanding of lament and suffering and what mm. passes for that in a culture that almost in a way worships it now. Yeah. I think the question of, of suffering and evil is one of the great perennial human questions. And some people think that it's only Christianity that has the problem of evil and suffering. That's not true. It takes a particular shape given the Christian worldview because we believe in an infinite personal God who is all good and all powerful. So if that's the case, why is there so much suffering? That's the framework of the problem or what is called the problematic for Christian theism. But every worldview, whether it's Buddhist or materialistic or Marxist has, and Marxism is a form of materialism, but not all materialism is Marxist. Every worldview has the question and problem of evil. So, for example, in my book, Christian Apologetics, and you said it was this thick. No, actually, it's this thick. Let's, let's get that. Uh, it can be used as a doorstop also. It probably has been in some cases. But uh, I don't address the problem of evil until the very end of the book because I want to build up the evidence for the existence of God from design arguments, cosmological arguments. I want to talk about the reliability of the New Testament, the claims of Jesus, his atoning death, his crucifixion before I talk about the problem of evil, because all of the evidence doesn't just vanish when you say, if God is all good and all powerful, why is there so much evil? Well, it should be put in the context of the antecedent or the surrounding evidence, right? But the Christian view is based on this, this grand uh, cosmic and theological story of creation, fall, and redemption. God created a good world. After he finished creating, he said it is very good. We are made in the image and likeness of God. Genesis 1 and 2. But human beings listened to the lie of the serpent, rebelled against God, fell. And ever since, we've had to deal with 
pain, suffering, and death, but God in his mercy has continued to pursue human beings by revealing himself in nature, in scripture, through the prophets, and ultimately through our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the suffering and victory of Jesus is what gives us the ultimate rational and existential hope for ourselves and actually for the universe. I start my big apologetics book with a question, is there hope for the universe? I mean, that's the ultimate existential philosophical query, isn't it? Is life worth living? Uh, is there hope for restoration and final goodness in this world of, of pain and struggles and tears? And the answer for Christianity is yes, it is. So uh, Christianity, in a sense, gives us permission to lament and suffer before God. I think of all the Psalms of lament, as I mentioned, Psalm 22, Psalm 88, Psalm 90, Psalm 39. I think of the lament of Jesus. We have a book in the Bible called Lamentations. Uh, you know, what did Robert Schuller do with that book in his study Bible? I'm, mm. I'm not sure, but uh, we have that, right? So the Bible says this is a true and rational worldview, and it gives the most meaning to life. And here's the way to be joyful. Here's the way to serve God when you're suffering. Uh, the Psalms, I think it was Calvin said, the Psalms address every human emotion and offer it up to God. Mm. And so we often should go to the Psalms uh, for all sorts of things. Let me give an example on the other side. Psalm 150 talks about praising God with loud crashing cymbals. And uh, I've been known to play drums. So <clears throat> one of my classes, I took in my gong. I have a little portable Zildjian gong, believe it or not, <laughs> that I had in my office that I would hit when people would come in in honor of them coming in or in honor of them departing. And uh, I brought it in one day and read Psalm 150 and just hit the gong as loud as I could to get everybody's attention. They thought, oh, Grotheis is weirder than we thought. <laughs> yes, you're right. And then when people would say something I thought was insightful, I hit the gong again. So, I mean, that's kind of a silly example, but that's more the rejoicing side. And for melancholics like me, we need that. We need to be told, rejoice in the Lord always. But we can also offer up uh, our tears. Scripture says God counts our tears, puts them in a bottle. But then we're also told in Revelation that one day he'll take all of our tears away. But it's not that the tears were unreal or that the tears never should have been shed. Jesus himself wept the tomb of Lazarus, John 11. And moreover, he was angry. If you look at the Greek there, he was deeply incensed in his, in his spirit in the face of death, because this is his good world, and death has entered as a enemy. And he, through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, session, and then and second coming, let's get all those Christological categories in there, will defeat death utterly and finally in the new heavens and the new earth. Mm. That's beautiful, Doug. I, I'm, it really... It's fun to have this conversation with you. Your your book on apologetics is one I tell students you need a reference library, and that book has got to be in it. And there, you know, there are a handful of others, including D David in my books, Understand the Times. Yeah, you, just a few, just a few key reference books that when you when an issue comes up, you can quickly find something that will give you an orientation to it. But I really appreciate the fact that you're you're drawing this back to real life. We don't just want to understand the times like the men of Issachar. We want to be able to know what to do like the men of Issachar. And <clears throat> I, want to, I want to kind of turn the, the question a little bit. You mentioned, you know, a, a, pos, a, a particular pastor who uh, preached positivity. And then you. I, I think we also have people who, you know, their, their, their view is negative, woe is me kind of thing all of the time. And, and I don't know, I sometimes wonder, okay, this is, this is great. Jesus wins. I, I understand that. I didn't even know that that passage in Revelation about him wiping every tear away from our eyes is the fulfillment of a prophecy from the book of Isaiah. Okay. I, I see how that makes the whole, the whole narrative come together, but how do I, I mean, I still have to live. I still have to live in my my regular life. The work's not done. I, I, in other words, I, I have to live in a hope because the secularist is right. 
when I look uh, on, on this point, that if I look at my day and I know that there's some part of that that is suffering, that's just not the way it should be. You know, I've lost students, for example. To me, that's one of the most heartbreaking things that I that, that can happen. You know, stu- that I'll spend time with a student. They'll they'll be at summit. They'll go home. They'll pass away. For you know, and it just different things happen. It happened the, earlier this summer, mm-hmm. and and I and I think so. Jesus ultimately wins, but my pain is right now. Help help me see for in your life how you've grappled with that, especially uh, you know if you if you wouldn't mind as you as you worked through Becky's uh, demise and her passing. Mm-hmm. I think knowing scripture and meditating on scripture and memorizing scripture is extremely significant because our minds are wild things; they go all over the place. So we need to to bring our thoughts and our affections back to truth, to what is real, stated in scripture. And uh, for many years, I don't have any, I don't think my desk is everything, everything is uh, akimbo here because we moved. (laughs) But I have these little cards, they're business cards. And I write on the back of them scriptures. And I've been doing that for about 40 years. And they're, they're all over the place right now. But I just put one up on my Facebook photo, actually, where you put a scripture and you can take it with you and read it and better yet, memorize it so you don't have to have it on a card. But we need to be truth people. We need to be truth seeking people. And the scripture is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword. Hebrews 412. So we need to live by the promises of God. What did he promise? What did he not promise? Well, he promised that all things will work together for the good, for those who love God, famous Romans 8, 28. But that didn't say there'll be no disease, there'll be no disappointment, there'll be no betrayal. It doesn't say that. It says in all these things, God will work together for the good. It doesn't mean everything that happens to you is good and pleasant. Or if bad and unpleasant things happen to you, that's because you lack faith or you're out of God's favor. Now, sometimes we get out of God's favor and he disciplines us. Scripture talks about that. I think that's in Hebrews 12. But not always. There's some suffering that I call inexplicable. And Rebecca's suffering was really inexplicable. So I can't say why she would have gotten this horribly cruel disease. However, that didn't disrupt or undermine my worldview as a Christian or my walk with the Lord ultimately because this inexplicable suffering was in a framework of knowledge. Hmm. Because knowledge is justified true belief and truth is correspondence to reality. And if you have a good apologetic and you've walked with the Lord, you have a framework of knowledge. You could talk about a foundation of knowledge on the scripture. And so within that framework, there's lots of pockets of the inexplicable. Now, inexplicable is not the same as meaningless. So here's where we depart, of course, from the nihilists and the existentialists. They say the whole thing is meaningless, but you just try to carve out meaning by sheer willpower, sheer imagination. It's all meaningless, but you create meaning as a meaningless point in a meaningless world. Wait a minute, how does that work? That's metaphysically, axiologically impossible. However, our worldview says within the framework of meaning, and if you want to put it this way, this great story of creation, fall, redemption, there's a, there are a lot of things we don't know, and in fact, we can't know. And I wrote an essay on this a couple of years ago at the Christian Research Journal about knowledge and ignorance as a Christian. And we've got passages like Deuteronomy 29, 29, and the great doxology at the end of Romans 11, where inspired scripture says there are limits to what we can know. Only God knows all things. He has revealed what we need to know, Deuteronomy 29, 29, but he's also kept secret a lot of things. And he has the prerogative to do that. And moreover, simply as finite beings, let alone fallen beings, there are some things we won't be able to know because of our intrinsic created limitations. So we want to 
live within the framework of knowledge on the foundation of knowledge and then live by the unconditional promises of God, like Romans 8, 28. And so many things, just the character of God. Uh, God is good and God is wise and he is with us always. There's so many promises. My, uh, my first wife, Rebecca, and I should say, uh, by the grace of God, I've happily remarried as of about five and a half years ago to Kathleen. But Rebecca put together a list of scriptures called simply called Bible Verses for Times of Stress. Hmm. And you can find those online. It's about eight typewritten pages of verses. And Rebecca was someone who really took the Bible seriously. She kept notes and typed up lists about scriptures on suffering, scriptures on spiritual warfare, scriptures on character. This is a woman who just took the Bible like a pit bull. Hmm and wanted to extract all the meaning and value and significance she could from it. So uh, we will have to suffer in many ways, and much of our suffering is not traceable to any particular action or may not even be directly relatable to any particular outcome. I mean, consider the book of Job on that, obviously. But it's not meaningless. Inexplicable does not mean meaningless for the Christian. Really important distinction. You know, you've, if you're talking about that knowledge, being justified true belief. I, I don't know if I've ever considered it in quite that way before, but I, I can think of an example. I, I mean, I used to do a lot of running on Pikes Peak. Not so much now. The training time takes forever. But when you train for the race... You, one of the ways you train is by running from Manitou Springs up to Bar Camp. It's about seven miles up the mountain. And then that's the turnaround spot. You can get a candy bar there <laughs> and reward yourself and get a drink of water and then turn around and come back. It is the, it's the point at which the suffering begins to reverse itself. Mm. Because you're, now you're on the downhill and you're coming home. So it's not the, ra- the run is not over, but you know now that you're on your way home and it's, it's downhill from there, but getting to that spot is hard. It's a hard run up to bar camp. What makes it possible that you know that the camp is there? It has Mm -hmm. been there. I have been to it dozens of times. It is, has been there for decades. It has not moved. I have knowledge, justified, true belief that the camp is there and that there will come a point in this run where my suffering will begin to reverse. Right. Yeah. Just that's a practical way of thinking of it. That's excellent. The power of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have that knowledge, if they said, you know what? Bar camp is mobile. We might have it there. We might not. Or we might move it. We might move it eight miles up the mountain or whatever. Or we might just not show up at all then then right. not having knowledge that there is this point of reversal mm-hmm. or of, of where things, you know, like in, in, in uh, Chronicles of Narnia where death itself begins to, to turn backwards. Uh, yeah. Without that Great knowledge. Example. Yeah. Yeah. Example. Then the suffering yeah. is just, it's, 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 it's an existential reality with no possibility of knowledge that it will mm-hmm. ever be resolved. Yeah, or you might say God doesn't move the goalposts. He's told yeah. us what's true about us, about sin, about life, death, resurrection, the work of Christ. And I, I can't help but think of Albert Camus' fav- uh, famous essay called The Myth of Sisyphus. Mm, yeah. I think it's one of the most overrated essays in the history of philosophy. <laughs> I do too. I agree and with you. <laughs> eventually, I'm going to write an essay about this. But he said Sisyphus is this character that rolls a big stone up a hill and then it rolls back down and he rolls it back up and it's an image of pointlessness and meaninglessness and Camus says no because Sisyphus invested in the work and found meaning in it Sisyphus is happy well if he's happy he's an idiot because he's not accomplishing anything it's the ultimate it's the apotheosis of futility so if you're just out in the world suffering sometimes having joy sometimes knowing you're going to die and after you're dead there's nothing you don't have any telos, you don't have any direction for your life, and you have no framework or matrix for assessing 
joy and pain and boredom and everything else. And that's exactly what God gives us in the scripture and which he activates in our consciousness through the Holy Spirit. And praise God, you know, I, Jeff, you've been a Christian for a long time. I've been a Christian now since 1976. And uh, the older I get and the longer I've walked with the Lord, the more remarkable I think the Christian faith really is. The more appreciative I am of the Lord, the wealth of wisdom in Scripture, the way God guides us, the opportunity for meaningful ministry. And as I get older, uh, I'm 67 now, I think about finishing well and making the deepest, biggest, best mark on the world I can while I'm here. And uh, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. To whom else can we go? We can't go anywhere yeah. else. That'd be yeah. utterly idiotic. Well, one of the themes of this show is truth changes everything. And I, I can't help but think that the understanding of suffering that you've outlined, and, and just to review it very quickly, God's okay with us talking about the suffering that we experience. And a lot of scripture writers did that, and they complained. They made their lament known to God, and that is recorded in the Holy Scriptures. It's, mm -hmm. it's not like that's off, off base. Right. At the same time, recognizing that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has begun to turn death backwards, and that there is a time coming when every tear will be wiped away. And the value of all of those tears will be known by us. Yeah, right. And, and I like to think of how that view of the world has changed things. And one obvious one that comes to my mind is just how Christians began the whole idea of health care, medical care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, up until, up until the, the church got involved in medical care, it was, you know, it was hit or miss. You have, you had some Greek writers whose work had been translated into Arabic and then translated back into a more familiar language. And people were working off of medical texts that were uh, more than a thousand years old hmm. and didn't really have a clear understanding of, of what it means to be human. But, but people from the church came along, um, you know, Harvey looking at the circulatory system, all these different things, they all became possible because they didn't view the world as an illusion. They did not view the world either as only a material thing that has no significance. They viewed right. human life as having meaning because we are image bearers of God. And even still today, even with the dramatic rise of secularism, still I think it's the case that about 20% of hospitals in the United States are, are based on hospital systems that came from a Catholic or a Lutheran or a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Moravian Brethren background. Right. So we can actually see that having a biblical view of suffering has quite literally changed the face of the earth. Exactly. And when secular people uh, value medicine, value health care, value philanthropic endeavors, they should go back and realize the basis for this historically and philosophically is a Judeo-Christian worldview. You can't find it. You can't get those resources out of an atheistic materialistic worldview. Uh, if atheism and materialism are true, we were not created with any purpose. When we die, we die. Suffering is meaningless. And, and that's it. There's really not much more to it. You know, many years ago, Jeff, I'm sure you read this book, The Universe Next Door by Jim Sire. Yes. I uh, read it as a young Christian. I taught, I think, every edition of the book for many years. And in that book, Jim talks about this progression from naturalism to nihilism. And naturalists want to say, we are just empirical and we understand the world scientifically. We don't worry about fairy tales like God and the afterlife. And we'll just get by. But the only way to get by is to live on the stolen capital of Christian theism, that humans are significant, that life has meaning, and there's some moral bearing to life. But if you're honest about your atheism, as Nietzsche was with this great madman parable, God is dead, we have killed him, you and I, you realize the universe is utterly evacuated of any meaning, value, and significance. And the only reason to do anything is sheer autonomous, arbitrary will. And that's nihilism. No. 
And nihilism is ultimately unlivable uh, unless you want to live it out like a, a Ted Bundy or something like that, uh, a serial killer uh, who may have repented actually before he died. Uh, so think about, think about the grace of God. Hmm. We might be in heaven with Ted Bundy hmm. if he repented because that's how great the grace of God in Christ is, that there's no one beyond hope if they bend the knee, humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, accept Christ as Savior and Lord. They can be forgiven of their sin, be justified, have a new life, and have eternal life. So I got the gospel in there yeah, for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. that yeah. That's that's very powerful. And I, I do want to ask one question, a practical one, as we wrap up the show. Uh, a lot of people who've gone through a suffering, and I'm thinking of people who've lost a loved one right now. That's going to be virtually everybody who's watching or listening to this show. They may experience a lot of compassion when people come around them. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, they're there for the, the funeral or the memorial. Um, but then your life goes on. And I'm, I'm just curious how, as, as you... You know, you've 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 found a new season in life after Becky passed away, and then um, you and Kathleen got married. Uh, but but that period of loss after other people are paying attention and helping you, mm-hmm. I just like for you to talk just about that for a minute. How how did you personally navigate that? Well, everybody has their own story and their own personality for loss. Um, Some people are very quiet. They don't want to talk about it. Some people want to talk about it. Some people get angry. Some people become very sorrowful. Some people try to not suffer, to just stuff it, to hold it in, which I don't think is a good idea. So... Biblically, the way to work through suffering and loss is to offer it all unto the Lord, keep praying, keep associating with other Christians, be in Christian fellowship, um, just walk with the Lord, basically. But that will look differently for different people. So for my situation, uh, Rebecca had been ill for a very long time before she died. So it was what is called a gradual loss. Now, when I was 11 years old, my father died in a plane crash just out of nowhere. He went on a trip and he died in a plane crash at Point Barrow, Alaska. That's another story, but that's sudden loss, unexpected, shock. We knew Becky would die within about three to five years after her diagnosis. So it was expected and it was gradual. And as one of my counselors said, uh, you're, you're losing Becky piece by piece. Now, she's still Becky. She's still God's child. She's still your wife, whatever happens. And I make that clear in the book. Footnote, you know, there's some people who say that if your spouse gets dementia or gets horribly ill, you can just walk away because they're not even there anymore. I'm tempted to use a colorful word right now. Mm. Uh, no, that is utterly wrong and horrible till death do us part, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. Okay. So anyway, (laughs) it was gradual loss. And then also, a second category that I found helpful was it was what's called ambiguous loss. Now, when I lost my father, when I was 11, there's nothing good about it. I mean, from my perspective, what could be good about that? It's my dad is gone. Now, with Becky, she was suffering horribly. It was very difficult to take care of her. I can't deny that. And so when she died and I was there, I knew she was with the Lord. Hmm. I knew that. It wasn't just like a hopeful thought. I knew her body stopped working, but I also knew that her spirit left her body and was directly, no purgatory baby, directly with the Lord. Okay. C.S. Lewis worried about joy being in purgatory in a grief observed. And it's one thing I don't like about that book. Anyway, I knew that Becky was with her Lord. And also, as a human being who had responsibility for my wife through some very difficult times, it was a kind of relief. So it was ambiguous. I lost my wife. We wept. It was horrible. I still weep. I still miss her. But 
in a way, it was a relief. And I had counselors and I read books that told me about this. And they said, don't suffer what's called survivor guilt. Mm. Sometimes people say, well, why did God take her and not me? And I didn't take care of her as much as I should have, so I feel guilty. Thank God I didn't feel any survivor guilt. And I realized that this was a gradual loss. It was an ambiguous loss. And so, and I had so many close friends and a very supportive church at the time, Wellspring Anglican Church. So I was able to get through that. And um, uh, the Lord provided uh, Kathleen as my new wife. And that's been a a new chapter. Ecclesiastes says there's a time to mourn and a time to dance. And uh, it was a very long season of mourning with Rebecca. I'm very grateful for her, our relationship, her contributions uh, to the kingdom. But it was really a long time of mourning and struggle and suffering. And uh, I'm still a a fussy old melancholic philosopher, but this is still (laughs) more of a time of dancing uh, the last several years than it is than it is of mourning. And uh, here I am in a new state, a new gig as a professor at Cornerstone University. And I'm very optimistic really about my future. And um, going up and down the stairs is harder. In fact, after uh, we finish this interview, I have some friends coming over to help assemble bookshelves. Yeah. And we got to get those bookshelves downstairs. And I'm 67 years old. It's not what it used to be. But uh, life has meaning. God is good. God is sovereign. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ mm. will come again. So let's put the pedal to the metal and tell everybody we can about this and defend it and live it out. Mm. That's a beautiful, beautiful way to end the show, Doug. Thank you for your vulnerability today and, and uh, for helping us to see God's truth in the middle of uh, circumstances that are very difficult. Tell us again the name of the book, Mm -hmm. the title of it. Yes, the book's called Walking Through Twilight, A Wife's Illness, A Philosopher's Lament. It was published by InterVarsity Press 2017. Walking Through Twilight. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people who are going to be wanting to pick that up as a result of the show and sharing it with others who they know might, might benefit from that. Because a biblical worldview doesn't say, smile it up and don't think about the hard things, it, 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 it operates in the light of actual reality. Right. And the actual right. reality is that um, there is coming a new, a new heaven and a new earth. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is one. Yeah, maybe I could just add one more thing if we have a sec. Um, I would often read scripture, of course, to Rebecca. And some of my favorite passages were from Revelation uh, the end of Revelation, where it speaks of the new heavens and the new earth. And it's an amazing picture of uh, a garden, a city, a temple, all in one. It's like the language can barely contain the beauty and glory yeah. of what is. Um, and I would read that to her and say, Becky, this is this is your future. In fact, once um, we were driving to go out to eat and she was lamenting, And I said, Becky, one day this will all be gone. We'll be in the new heavens and the new earth. And she looked at me and said, but Doug, is it really true? Mm. Now, Becky was a committed Christian. She knew apologetics. But in the crush of this circumstance, and given what dementia can do to your brain and all the rest of it, and I said, and I really believe God inspired me to say this. It may sound strange. I said, Becky, do you think I'm smart? And thank goodness she said yes. (laughs) And then I said, Becky, do you remember that big apologetics book that I wrote and that you edited? And she said, yes. I said, I assure you that what we believe is true. The evidence and arguments are for the truth of Christianity. I said, I assure you that this is true. And it was almost like I was helping her believe. It was almost like I was vicariously providing some of the faith that she was lacking a little bit. Yeah. And she said, yes, it is true. Now, that was not the end of the lament. There was a lot of suffering that went on. But that's one of my favorite examples about the significance of apologetics. It's not just for eggheads like us to have arguments and write our books and give our lectures and do our debates. This anchors the truth in reality through reason. And when we don't experience, maybe, the joy of the Lord, or he seems absent, you don't have to give up the ship. 
because this is true, whatever our experience is, and the work that you put in to showing that the Christian worldview is rational, it's coherent, it makes better sense of everything than any other worldview. When you hit the toughest times, the dry times, you don't just say, oh, is it really true or not? Yes, it is true. Yeah. And sometimes you'll get that Holy Spirit assurance and a sense of peace and joy and praise God for that. But when you don't, Christianity is as true in the desert as it is when everything is just going well and you're feeling the presence of the Lord. It's true. It's real. Count on it. Take it to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. And especially just realizing at the very most basic level what you know from scripture is that God is not the kind of God who moves the goalposts. Yeah. That exactly. we, we know, we can know, we can know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks brother. Thanks for your time today. Really grateful. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you to my guest, Doug Groteis for coming on the show today. You can learn more about Dr. Groteis and what he's up to at douglasgroteis.com. <laughs> you're going to need me to spell that out. Douglas, D-O-U-G-L-A-S, Grotice is spelled like this. Dutch people, you already know this, but everybody else, here it is. G-R-O-O-T-H-U-I-S. DouglasGrotice.com. This podcast is a resource of Summit Ministries. At Summit, we exist alongside the rising generation, their trainers, parents, influencers, to help young adults know God's truth and become champions of a biblical worldview. To learn more about Summit Ministries or to get more resources to help the young people in your life embrace and share the truth that changes everything, visit summit.org. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.